All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for coming. We're gonna just open our Christmas service. You at home, I'm glad you tuned in today. Merry Christmas to you all. So is this a little hot? It seems like it, so. But anyways, uh, but I have old ears, so I might have been imagining things, so. But nonetheless, uh, I'm glad you came today. Merry Christmas. Uh, we have uh, several things we want to do. We have a great service plan. I just trust you'll just open your heart and receive what God has for you. He has something directly for your heart today, so for you at home too. So we're going to open with a with a uh, video and uh, begin that way. So uh, Pam, why don't you go ahead and roll. Everything I do turns into a disaster. I guess I really don't know what Christmas is all about. Isn't there anyone who knows what Christmas is all about? Sure, Charlie Brown. I can tell you what Christmas is all about. Lights, please. And there were in the same country shepherds, abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them. And the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were sore afraid, and the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God, and saying, Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. That's what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. This is the fourth week of Advent. We're going to light the fourth candle. The fourth candle is traditionally called the angel candle. The angels are God's messengers to announce the coming of the Lord. The angel Gabriel spoke to Mary and Joseph to announce the birth of Jesus. The angels sang out with joy to proclaim Jesus' birth. To the shepherds, the angel Michael announces the coming of Christ again and the revelation to John. We hear angels' voices even today and wait with joy for Jesus. <clears throat> I should have worn these candles off. That's a <laughs> lesson for next year, I suppose. <clears throat> the scripture for today is Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 14. In that reason, there were shepherds living in fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. <clears throat> then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. <clears throat> and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was an angel with a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven. <clears throat> and on earth, peace among those whom, fa whom he favors. So, uh, if you guys don't mind standing to your feet, we're going to start with some worship here.
beauty of simplicity brings me down to my knees. I'll praise you for eternity. Lord, I love you because you first love. service, Lord, speak to us so clearly, so clearly that we will have no excuse but to respond one way or another. We do love you, Lord. Amen. You may be seated. some notes if you'd like to take some notes Don and I were riding our riding our bikes this week and uh, in the cold we have some winter gear and we put it on and riding our bikes and I was down at uh, uh, the intersection we were riding the inter we were heading to the green belt and we were heading towards the inner uh, we were in the intersection of Paxton Street and 19th Street and I was sitting there ready to cross Paxton Street and I did what rookies do 
and I'm not a rookie, but I did what a rookie does. And he didn't, I didn't tie my laces on my shoes. <laughs> I didn't tie them out of the way. I usually tuck them in, tuck them in so they don't get caught in the pedal. And I stopped and my seat was high anyways. It was a little high and I was just on my tippy toes <laughs> trying to balance like this. And uh, I, I, there's traffic all around me. I was in the lane and traffic all around me and I went to put my foot down. And if you've ever done that, I was going, <laughs> trying to get my foot off the pedal. And it wouldn't go because my laces were tying, tangled in my pedal. And I just went, kaboom, <laughs> right in traffic. Now it was stopped, it was stopped, but the, my bruises, it didn't even hit hard. I didn't hit hard, but I just felt like in slow motion, I went, oh, here it goes, here it goes. <laughs> and you just fall. And then I'm trying to get my foot out of there, laying on the ground and traffic is still all around me. And they're all going, I saw some of their faces. <laughs> some of their faces. And then two young ladies, if you don't think there's kind people out there, two young ladies, small young ladies come out and they had their hands on me and just, and they were trying to help me up, trying to help me up in traffic. No one was blowing their horn. I was surprised. <laughs> yeah, they're all watching. So, and they helped me up. And the last thing I thought, I was on my way down to hit the pavement. And I saw Donna heading through the intersection. <laughs> she never looked back. And on my way down, I said, Donna! And then halfway through the intersection, I think she looked back. And I don't did you do a Yui? You did a Yui right in the middle section. And so she came back and, uh, and I was just, those girls picked me up and stood my bike up and they start, I said, oh, thank you for your kindness and you're very kind. And I said, I'm all right. I'm just more embarrassed than everything, anything else. So I walked over the side of the road and Donna tied my shoes. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to tell you, I felt almost 85 years old. Like this is my bike. <laughs> like this. <laughs> so anyways, I got a strawberry on my knee and, and uh, so... But uh, anyways, uh, but it's a good lesson. Uh, it's a rookie lesson. You really have to care for those laces because they will cause you a problem. Lou, have you ever done that? I've done it with laceless, laceless shoes. Okay, it's yes. Part of the adventure. Yes, yeah. I didn't consider that a fun part though. So, but uh, not, yeah, it's nonetheless. So, but uh, anyways, we begin today uh, with uh, with a. a sort of an unusual message for Christmas today. And it is unusual uh, because we serve a God that had an unusual way of showing his love to the world. It's, so it's an unusual message that way. A way that no one ever projected or even uh, predicted. The way he would show his love to this world, uh, our, our, our Savior. The last few weeks, we, we, we've been in a, a message called The Gift. The Gift, we've looked at three different types of gifts that the wise men brought to this, to this Savior of ours. Gifts that wise men gave Jesus. Wise men gave them to him. So if you don't know the story, the scriptures, because we're living in a day where honestly people, I, I believe many people don't know the story of, of this Christmas. But anyways, the scriptures teach that Jesus was born a virgin. Magi, or wise men, they were wealthy and they were, they, they were astrologers in, in that uh, sense of the word, but they saw a star and a star guided them to uh, Jerusalem. And then they got information on where exactly in this area is the Savior to be born? And then the priests came together and, and, the, and the, uh, the Jewish priests came together and said, well, the scriptures teach it in Matthew chapter, or Micah chapter 5, verse 2 or 6, 
But uh, it says that he's going to be born in a town called Bethlehem, which was five miles from Jerusalem, Bethlehem. So uh, they came a long way to worship the king. We don't know how many wise men there were, but tradition says there were, uh, the tradition just says there were three because we line it up with three gifts. But it's never said how many wise men there were. So anyways, we, uh, we began looking at these gifts uh, two weeks ago in Matthew chapter 2, verse 10. And let me go ahead and read that verse to you. It says, and when the wise, and, and they, the wise men, saw, uh, saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother, Mary. And they bowed down because it was a time away from, it was months uh, away from the actual birth of Christ. So they were in a house by then. But uh, they bowed down and worshipped him when they saw him. Then they opened their treasure chest and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh they gave him. So week one, we talked about frankincense. Frankincense connected Jesus, as we saw and looked at that, it connected Jesus to being our high priest. All throughout the Old Testament, and you know this, if you know the scripture a little bit in the Old Testament, you know that priests gave sacrifices. They were the mediators between the people and God. They gave sacrifices of lambs and actually all kinds of things that God instructed them to give. But uh, Jesus was our high priest here, and, uh, and he is our mediator between God and man. He gave his life. Instead of offering a sacrifice of some sort, he gave his life and poured out his blood on the cross. So uh, he was our high priest that gave his life and now sits at the right hand of God the Father. And the scripture says that he intercedes. He intercedes for us and all people. All people of, all people of, of Christ's following faith. Then last week we looked at myrrh. Myrrh represents Jesus as the suffering son. As the suffering son, as suffering servant, the Lamb of God that gave his life. He was born to give his life as a sacrifice for our sins. Myrrh was a burial salve and an oil to prepare bodies at burial. It's a strange gift to give to kids. To give to a kid. I wouldn't even know how to describe how I would feel if someone gave us a, mo a bottle of myrrh uh, for the birth of Tim and Ange or whatever. So, but myrrh was a burrow sap, uh, burrow sap to uh, prepare bodies. Today, we're going to look at the gift of gold. That was the third gift they gave. Throughout history, and because of the scarcity of gold, uh, and value of gold, this gift was known as a gift fit for a king. A gift fit for a king. The message title today is A King Like No Other. A King Like No Other. So, to get us into the king mindset, I'd like you just to put us there in context. We're going to play just a small game, and the game's called Name That King. Name that king. And uh, honestly, I ask you to jump right in. If you recognize and, and can speak up, I'd like you to free to participate. It's just way more fun if you participate. <laughs> so anyways, I'll show you some different kings, and I want you to name that king if you can. Some won't be able to, but some will. So all right, we're going to go ahead, and uh, here goes. Picture number one. If you think about this, picture number one, if you think of Simba, uh, what king do you think of? Mufasa. Yes, yes, Lion King. Lion King, he's the king. So, And then picture number two. How about this? It's a big gorilla. How about King Kong? He's the king of the jungle, yes. And then picture number three. If you think of a water, what restaurant comes to mind if you think of that? Burger King. Burger King. In fact, about a month ago, I haven't had one in about 20 years. And then they did that two for five thing. 
it sucked me right in. And I said, I go try these. I have to see if this is a childhood memory or I went and had one. And honestly, I could have ordered two more. So I shared one with Donna. She gave me half of hers. And, and but uh, honestly, hold the pickle, hold the lettuce. Special orders don't upset us. So yeah, that kind of reveals my age. That was a slogan a long time ago for Burger King. So, and then picture number four. If you think of scary novels, Stephen King. Stephen King. There you go. And then picture number five. Uh, if you think about interviews, Larry King. Yes, yes, yes. And then how about picture number six? If you think of basketball, can anybody remember that? Anybody think about that? Who? King James. LeBron King James, yes, yes, some of you folks that don't follow basketball, you know, they, you just wouldn't know, so, anyways, picture number seven is for baby boomers, maybe older boomers, Billy Jean King, yes, Did, how many of you knew who know Billy Jean King, about half of you, yeah, okay, yeah, I gotta watch my pictures, so, so anyways, you leave a lot of people out. Then how about lastly, there's music. It's BB King. BB King. Yes. And that's another kind of older, I think. I think it's an older folks, BB King. Chrissy, did you know that? Yeah. Oh, you know, Bam. Yeah, she's a music girl. So, yeah. anyways. So, today we're talking about a king like no other. A king like no other. Jesus was not just a man born into royalty, but he's the king of all kings. The scripture says, and Lord of all lords. The Apostle Paul wrote this to his son in the Lord. Timothy, Timothy wasn't his, his physical son, but he was a son he led to Christ. And he wrote this to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 5. It says this, For at just the right time, Christ will be revealed from heaven by the blessed and only Almighty God. He says, the King of all kings and Lord of all lords. Paul wrote this, and it couldn't have been more powerfully clear what he was saying. Jesus is King of all kings over all kingdoms on the earth. He's a king like no other. Back in Bible days, way back in Bible days, people were expected, they were, the Jewish people were expecting a king to be born. They were looking for a Messiah. Uh, and they, they knew what the scripture says up to that point. The Jews expected their king to be born in a palace. In royalty. Because he's a king. They, respected, they expected him that way. They expected him to be surrounded by wealth and power. Luxury and comfort. They expected their king. That's why it was so upsetting and, and shocking that this king arrived this way. He was like a king like no other. So this king they expected his crib would be lined with royal purple robes. That's what they thought. He would be dressed in little Gucci onesie, onesies. Yeah. This king. That's what they expected. Gucci onesie, onesies for our king. No one expected their king no one did. Expected their king to be born in poverty. No one expected that. In a cave next to farm animals. Oh, how, 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 just a ridiculous thought for your king to be born with farm animals. In a cave next to farm animals. They didn't expect the Messiah to be the son of a carpenter. Born in Nazareth. And then, and then Nathaniel asked this, when he heard about the king born in uh, Nazareth, he said this, can anything at all good come out of Nazareth? It was like, it was like an area of town or a town that was just looked down upon, like, like some areas of a bad city or, or like a, some bad areas of a city. They would say, you were born there? You were, you, you lived there? That's shocking. But they said, can anything good at all come out of Nazareth? No one predicted that the King of Glory, the Son of God, would befriend prostitutes. <laughs> A king doesn't do that. Befriend prostitutes. Toots. Or touch those with leprosy. 
he would touch them. <laughs> or love those that all the religious institutions, all the religious institutions rejected. They never imagined a king that chose uneducated fishermen, tax collectors, and rebellious troublemakers. Do you remember uh, Simon the Zealot? Simon the Zealot, he was a rebellious uh, zealot, a uh, Jewish zealot. They never expected this king to choose those in his closest circle to be all that, to be his own disciples. No one ever imagined that a king would forgive a woman that was caught directly in adultery. He would forgive her for the very act of adultery when the law said she should be stoned. No one ever expected that out of the king. And yet this king overturned tables in the temple when he thought people were misusing the temple for their own personal gain and ripping people off in the temple. They never imagined the king of, of the Jews, the king of the Jews, riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. On a donkey. Kings rode in on majestic horses. That's what kings do. With an entourage. Jesus rode in on a donkey. Rode in on a donkey. And those who cheered his arrival were all the outcasts. Were all the overlooked in society. And the immoral of the day. Those who cheered his, his, his arrival. No one expected a king to stand trial for crimes he didn't even commit. For sure, he did not commit these crimes. No one ever imagined that an innocent king would be beaten. Just beaten, whipped, and pounded on without mercy. No one expected that. Stripped naked and hung on a cross that was only reserved for criminals. No one ever dreamed that this king would hang on a cross as onlookers mocked and spit upon his body. The most disgraceful thing. No one ever dreamed that that would happen to a king. It just can't happen. No one ever imagined a king hanging on a cross and looking towards heaven. And saying, Father, forgive them, for these do not know what they're doing. No one ever imagined that type of king. And when he breathed, breathed his last breath, no one ever predicted the sky would go dark. When he died, the sky turned dark. And the earth would shake. There were earthquakes. And the world lost hope. No one ever predicted that type of king. And then no one imagined, three days later, as the women went to check out the tomb, and the stone was rolled away. No one ever imagined that. The tomb was empty, and no one imagined it. They just couldn't imagine what has happened here. Christ rose from the dead, to live forevermore. He's a king like no other. It's an unusual Christmas, Christmas message because he is an unusual savior. No one imagined him coming that way. In your notes, I've listed three responses. Three responses to Christ Jesus as king. Three common responses of the day. These were first century responses. First century responses, way back in the day, Bible days, these were responses to Jesus as king. And here we are 2,000 years later, and we see very much some of the exact same responses today. I know we think, oh, no, they were different in Bible days. Okay, yeah, they did dress different, but their hearts were very much the same as people today. Responses to Jesus 
as king, if people would have the courage, honestly, to be honest with themselves, all of us, and those listening, if you have the courage to be honest with yourself, they would maybe find themselves smack dab in the, middle, in the middle of maybe one of these responses. If we would have the courage to be honest about our own lives. Responses to Jesus as king. In your notes, think about this. The first response is Herod's response. Now, not a lot of people, I would say maybe not anybody here, would have Herod's response. But he wanted to guard. Listen, Herod opposed Jesus as king. Herod opposed Jesus as king. He wanted, listen, he wanted to guard and protect his kingship. And a very jealous man, a very overdone kind of, I mean, any kind of opposition. Uh, I think he killed his, his wife and his son because they made a couple of what he deemed a treasonous uh, uh, comments. And so he killed him. So, but that's the kind of guy he was. But uh, listen, he was there to protect his kingship. And uh, when he heard there was another king born over Bethlehem way, he had all the baby boys killed age two and under. All the baby boys killed two and under just to secure, just in case, one of those little baby boys is born a king. And he's going to take kingship one of these days uh, because one of the boys might threaten his kingship. That's what he did. So, there are loads who, like Herod, oppose Jesus as king. Loads. They oppose Jesus as king. Modern day opposition says this. Modern day. 2,000 years later says, I don't need Jesus. I'm doing fine on my own. I don't need Jesus. I can't let some outdated book Tell me what to do. The scriptures. I can't. I just cannot let that happen. Or some stupid church suggest how to live. I can't do that. I got this. I oppose Jesus as king. That's clearly. That's Herod's attitude. But only he had, power, uh, he had power to just follow through with even more than that. But that's the man. That's uh, people we people we live and know. People, that's their attitude. Some, that's their attitude. I oppose Jesus as king because if they acknowledge he is king, then it requires something from us that we acknowledge that, and it's true what he says. Response number two in your notes. <laughs> response number two. This response is profoundly, absolutely, profoundly common today. Jewish priests didn't oppose Jesus. They dismissed Jesus as king. Dismissed him as king. This is bizarre because these Jewish priests were there. When the wise men arrived in Jerusalem, they were there. Herod called them in and said, hey, these guys are looking for the newborn king. And uh, could you tell us where the ancient scriptures tell us he's going to be born? And these priests... These priests spoke up right away and said, in Bethlehem, it's a small little town, but this king is going to be born. This newborn king is going to be born in Bethlehem, which is five miles away. Think about this. These priests knew that, and they were five miles away, and they never showed up. Or it's never recorded that they showed up to see if it was all true, that the Savior was born in Bethlehem. The same thing happens today. They dismissed it. The priest dismissed him as king, somehow, some way. The same thing happens today. Everything, almost everything, is more important, more exciting, more interesting, more pleasurable than worshiping Jesus. Almost everything. Loads of folks don't oppose Jesus as king. Loads don't. They don't oppose him as king, but they dismiss Jesus 
as king. Dismiss him. It's way more friendly to dismiss Jesus as king. I know you know that is true. If you can just possibly think about that, even in your own lives and own hearts. I've had to think about that all week, that we don't oppose Jesus. I didn't. But I dismissed him in large areas of my life. Then there's the response number three. The response of the wise men. It's in your notes. The response of the wise men. The wise men bowed down and worshipped Jesus as king. They bowed down and worshipped as king. Scripture says they bowed down. It's the most sincere response to bow our hearts to Jesus. It's the most sincere response. In a very sincere way, I'd have to ask you this as you think about this. I'd have to ask you this. What is your response to Jesus as King? Even you at home, I would have to ask you at home, what is your response? I would say if you're tuned in, you probably don't oppose him like Herod. But a broad spectrum of our world dismisses him. Dismisses him. And then there's another section that bows to worship him like the wise man. I ask you, do you oppose him? I don't need him. I got this, Lord. I got this. We're like loads of people. Do you dismiss him? Is that what it is? It's a good story. Many think it's a good story, fun story. I like that. We tell it to the kids and they just, they like it. It's a good, it's a good story. I did the church thing when I was a kid, but uh, it's good, but not for me. Not for me. We dismiss Jesus as king. We dismiss him. Or is Jesus king of your heart and of your life? Those are broad choices. But if we're honest, we fall somewhere. We fall somewhere smack dab in the middle of them somewhere. Early on in my life, I learned, honestly, I learned. We were in church, my parents took us. We learned loads about Christ. His stories, his miracles, and... And uh, my parents taught, and they taught us about his death, resurrection. I, we, we learned all that stuff. All that stuff. And oh, oh, I knew about him. I knew about Christ. And then for 10 years of my young life, 10 years, about 10 years, I dismissed him. Dismissed him. Dismissed him. I didn't reject him. I didn't oppose him. I just dismissed him. Dismissed him. Everything was more important than Jesus as king. Everything was to me because I dismissed him. Ten years. Ten years of all hell breaking loose in my life. Ten years. It might have been ten and a half or nine and a half. But I look back at those years, they are so foggy. Ten years I dismissed him as king. I knew about him, but I did not know him. I never denied him, but I dismissed him. Dismissed him. I was going to do life my way, doing my thing, because... I'm good, Lord. I'm good. I'm good. I know where I'm going. I know what I'm doing. But no matter what, at times there was an aching in my soul at quiet times. And so rarely I let things get quiet. I just didn't let things get quiet. I always had something roaring, something playing, something Always a plan, never without something to do, because those quiet times bothered me. They bothered me. A real sense of dishonesty showed up in my heart. And I just 
many times just brushed it away. In my marriage, I acted. I acted like I was all in. I acted. I maybe could have got an Academy Award for the act. But I acted like I was all in. Acted. Acted like I was all in, but I wasn't. But I was not. I was always drawn away by all kind of things. And I acted like I wasn't drawn away. Like it's just no big deal. But I was drawn away. Donna couldn't put her finger on what was wrong because she was always all in. I never had those doubts. She was always all in. But I knew my heart was, was a big part of the problem. And it was an act, just an act. And you just get pretty good at acting. You know what to say and what not to say. But I felt dishonest in my heart, a, a lingering of dishonesty in my heart. Then one day, one day, the Spirit of God smacked me in my heart. The Spirit of God. I knew Donna was praying for me, and I just said, Oh, please, stop with that. And I knew not to say foul things against the Lord. I was raised in a Christian home. And somehow I had that, that understanding you can do a lot of things, but do not mock the Lord Jesus. And so I didn't. So I just mocked her. Then one day the Spirit of God smacked me in the heart. And God began speaking to me. And one of the things he said early in that morning was, Last call. This is your last call, Kevin Brown. Now, I don't know whether he knew, God knew, the Spirit of God knew, because I was familiar with drinking and closing down bars. And being there at the last call meant last drink. We're not serving anymore after this, so I'd order two or three or four. Last call, that's what you do. And so it's familiar language to me. Last call, Kevin Brown. God said to my heart, last call, bow your knee to me. That's what he said to me. Bow your knee to me. And in all the confusion and all the fog and in all the, and in all the, the, uh, the confusion of even me having a divided heart in that moment, there was a point of clarity in my life. I heard the Spirit of God say to me, last call, and I knew what he was saying to me because God had spoken to my heart dozens of times before, and I just shut it off. Shut it off and did something else. The Spirit of God was calling me, and it was so distinct. In all the fog, I heard that, Last call, Kevin Brown. Stop resisting. Repent. Repent. And that very day, that very morning, I got up out of my bed, got a shower, and threw on some old clothes. I didn't even have any good clothes. I didn't have any Sunday go meeting clothes. I just threw them on. And I waited for Donna. She was in tears already. We had already had a scuffle that morning and she had already been in tears and she was just now confused. I was sitting in the car waiting for her and she goes, what's going on? I said, come on, let's go, come on, let's go. I didn't tell her, I was too embarrassed to tell her that God just smacked me. I was too embarrassed to even say a word. I just said, please just get in get the kids in. She was pregnant as nine, nine months pregnant. And she was just upset with my, just with me and my big fat mouth. I said, please just get in. She got in, we went to church. I headed right down front 
sat in the second spot. I could tell you I was there about a month ago and I just kept staring at that seat. And the pastor preached. He was an old time special speaker. And I was thinking all week, oh, this guy's going to be so, he's got one foot in the grave and he's probably going to be so stupid. And uh, all he's going to do is you're going to hardly be able to hear him. That guy spoke and fire come out of his nostrils. And I was sitting there, my eyes were like silver dollars. And at the end of the service, he gave an invitation. And before he even said amen, amen, I ran to the altar in repentance for Christ and gave my heart wholly to the King of all kings. And it wasn't because he was so cute with children. And it wasn't because he was just so nice. It was the fact that he was king of all kings. And he spoke to my heart. And I knew what I needed to do. Repent. I have never been the same since. That very day I bowed my heart to the king like no other. The king like no other. But please know this, this Christmas story is just part of the story, the Christmas story. The baby Jesus is just part of a bigger picture. Last page for anyone counting. He was born to die for our sins so we could live in freedom and tell his story. Tell his story. Jesus is the king like no others, like no other king. Will you bow like the wise man and give Christ the gift of your heart? We don't need to come up with golds, uh, myrrh and frankincense. Give him the gift of your heart. You have a brand new year coming. 2022 it's kind of amazing 2022 and I ask you to give your heart to Christ it could be the greatest year of your life 2022 could be the greatest year of your life the end let's bow for prayer Father thank you Thank you that you burst through the fog, even in my own life, because it was foggy. You burst through the fog and called and punched me right in the heart. Thank you, Lord. If you're speaking to someone today and you're bursting through the fog of their own hearts and lives, I ask you to do that, Lord, and draw them to you, even like you are a specialist to do, Lord. Specialist to do those things. You are a fog buster in the life of people that desire to know you. Bust through the fog of our lives, Lord, and speak to our hearts. Help us to do business with you. With heads bowed and eyes closed, if today you've come and, and you'd say, Pastor, Jesus, the Holy Spirit of God, has spoken to my heart. And I need to stop running. I need to stop the dishonesty in my own life. And I need to stop chasing him and dismissing him. <clears throat> I want to start afresh with you, Lord Jesus. With heads bowed and eyes closed, if you'd pray this prayer with me. It's just a simple prayer, but it's a prayer of, it's the prayer I prayed that day at Pennsville Church on my knees. It goes like this. Dear Lord Jesus, if you'd pray that prayer quietly to your in your heart to the Lord. Dear Lord Jesus, today I ask you 
to be my Lord and Savior. I ask you to forgive my sin, Lord, and clean my heart and become Savior of my life. I invite you in today with heads bowed and eyes closed. If you prayed that prayer in this private moment, would you slip your hand up and say, Pastor, I did. Would you just slip your hand up and see hands all over the auditorium? Yes. I thank you. You can put them down. Anyone else? Anyone else? Say, Pastor, I did. I asked Jesus Christ today to be my Savior. Father, you saw those hands. I ask you today, honestly, Lord, help them to sense your presence. Just do what you promised to do, Lord, and come into their lives and become their Savior. Thank you for your gift of salvation. Thank you for coming to earth like you did, born of a virgin, raised to die on the cross and pay for my sin and those of here today, those everywhere. I ask you, Lord, thank you. I thank you for that. Thank you for those that responded. Thank you, Lord, for those that you've touched today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And the band's going to close us in a couple Christmas carols, so that'll be fun. But God bless you. Merry Christmas. Right, if everybody could stand and uh, worship with me today. Silent now, holy now, all is calm. See you. 
close in prayer and just rejoice. I trust you have a great Christmas. I trust you have a great, great Christmas with Christ in the center. It's just the best if we can manage that somehow. Santa Claus and all that's fun with kids and just a side story and a side little funny thing. But Christ is the reason. And if you can keep Christ there, you will have a way better Christmas. At least you will, anyways. So, we're going to close in prayer. And I just wish you all a very Merry Christmas, a Christ-centered Christmas. Let's close in prayer. Father, we love you. Thank you for just what you did for us and made it possible for all that bow their knee to you. I ask you, Lord, if there's one here today that just would like someone to pray with them, just do not leave, Lord, before that happens. I ask you, Lord, to just be with us as we travel, as we celebrate this next seven days. Just help us to rejoice in what you did on the cross. I ask you to do that. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I wanted to say this. If you have a prayer need and you'd like to pray with someone, Lou and Robin are down front here. They're not going to leave until uh, you, till you, they make time for you. So anyways, God bless you. You are dismissed.